You know, the virgin birth of Jesus was supernatural. Amen. Now, there's a lot of people who look at it in different ways. They think it's a story. But Christmas is an amazing time of the year. See, Christmas is our holiday, believer. It's our holiday. It started with Christ. So don't be a Scrooge or a Grouch if others get carried away with it. It's okay. Uh, yesterday, I ran across a statement that sums it up. I said, isn't it amazing how a baby born 2,000 years ago could cause traffic jams in every major city of uh, the world for a whole month? True, isn't it? Christmas is a miracle based on miraculous events. I'm referring to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. A doctrine that's often taken for granted by believers. But from the very beginning, there have been those who doubted it, who didn't think it was supernatural, who thought it was some kind of a, a scheme or a, a story or a fable. If Jesus was not God in the flesh, then what we believe is just a silly idea. And there's no reason for us to meet here together today to do what we've just done. None. If he did not come from the womb of a virgin girl named Mary, if he did not rise from the dead on the third day, his appearance being recognizable to those who knew him, then this is all a scam. This really doesn't have any validity or meaning or bearing. C.S. Lewis, the great writer, a man who came to Christ at 30 years of age after being a skeptic, much like Paul was. He didn't murder Christians, but he thought we were a bunch of kooks, which is what a lot of the world thinks. But he finally gave this definition. He said, a miracle is an interference of nature by a supernatural power. Amen. That's what happened on one starry night around Bethlehem. One of the greatest miracles to have ever taken place, one of the greatest things to have ever happened is when God interfered with his own laws of how things should be done and stepped in to the nothingness of this world and created a moment that would never, ever be forgotten. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling or dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, the Father, who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Now, there's been many controversies through the years. About 100 years ago, a great controversy stirred up, uh, with, mainly with liberal theologians. See, the virgin birth ranks with the resurrection and the second coming as the fundamentals, the cornerstone, the foundation of our faith. But liberals have a tendency to deny those very critical points of what we believe. They call this virgin birth and this resurrection and this second coming uh, unnecessary irrational doctrine, especially the virgin birth. That's the one that they, some of them can't do either the virgin birth or the resurrection. Uh, a, a man named Harry Emerson Fosdick, who was a well-noted writer and theological um, guy, he, he said, I don't believe in the virgin birth. I don't know any intelligent minister who truly believes that. So I'm not intelligent, so I want you to know that because I believe that. Amen. And then 35 years ago, a group of liberal scholars got together, bid me meeting, and they tried to determine the true words of Jesus. Did Jesus really say this, or is this some fallacy, some fable? Each of the participants were given three marbles, actually a vial of marbles, pink, red, and black. And if they put black down on a question, it meant that it, they didn't believe it was true at all. If they put pink down, it probably was true. Red meant that it could go either way. So they finished their work. This so-called Jesus seminar is what it was called. Blackballed the virgin birth and called it a legend that has no true validity. Now, they considered as they talked through this that Mary and Joseph must have had, or Mary particularly, must have had a sexual relations with Joseph before they were truly married. Or uh, they determined that she might have had some kind of relationship with some other person. But that this was all a fallacy that Barnes Tatum, another theologian uh, who wrote a lot of books, 
So the gospel accounts of Jesus' birth are simply theological fiction. So it's only a short step from denying the virgin birth of Christ to not denying his deity at all, have you noticed? I mean, you just take one piece of this out. It, it is a whole cloth. It is not, it is not some threads you just kind of lay on top of each other. This thing God created. First you attack the birth, then you attack the baby. First you attack the man, then you attack the miracle. You see, you can't take parts that you want out of it and remain as a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ. The point of that is he became one of us. I remember when the world stood, Carol and I are old enough to remember when we saw the first man walk on the moon on television. Was that an odd, amazing sight? Some of you here remember that. But the event at Bethlehem on that starry night was much more amazing than a man walking on the moon. Because God in the form of man came past the moon to earth to stand here on this earth and do the miraculous. Christmas is not the celebration of the beginning of Jesus. It's the celebration of his arrival on earth. He was already here at the very be before the very beginning of this whole thing. He was there present as God. Colossians 1 15. Paul telling the church at Coloss, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. The Holy Spirit wants you to get this today. He is the image of of the invisible God. Jesus showed us who God is. This key word image is icon, and it means it's spelled E-I-K-O-N, not like icon on your computer, e -I, but that's where that came from. Icon means picture, image, uh, uh, something that you know what it means, and so you click on it, and your computer opens up in that program. This is the program of God. Jesus is the image, the icon of God, indicating the revelatory character of the incarnation and what it means for all of us. Jesus is God. Amen. Jesus said himself, John 14, 9, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. I only do what I see the Father do. So he must have been there before because he saw something in heaven during the Old Testament that he recreated in the image of God in the New Testament. The miracles weren't just happening in the New Testament. They were happening in the Old Testament too with the same power and the same persona. He was God. Came to earth as one of us. Think about that. Manifestation of God looking like us. Wow. Think about it. Philippians 2. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form as he humbled himself to do that. He became one of us. Flesh and blood. John 18, 37 says, in fact, for this reason, he says, I was born. And for this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. He said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. I am showing you who God is. It declares when the virgin birth actually happened, it happened in time and space, which is not exactly what God usually uh, uh, wants us to understand. He wants us to understand time and space. We live by clocks and by calendars, but what God wants us to see is, cal is not a calendar. It is an eternal. What we have to move into is supernatural. He doesn't live by clocks. He doesn't live by calendars. He lives by the miraculous. It's the supernatural, not the natural. We're bound by this, but he is not. Miracles are hard to understand, even harder to believe sometimes. The miraculous that happens today, I still believe miracles are for today. After 2,000 years, I think we don't, we don't quite comprehend how strange it must have been to try to sell this gospel to folks who lived then. I mean, you think about it. Think about their world. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't have Christian television. They didn't have Christian radio. They didn't have uh, thousands of years of history. 2,000 years ago, it was fresh. It was new. It was, it, it was unbelievable. How could you go tell someone that, hey, he was born of a virgin. And hey, he was crucified, but he's alive again. Can you imagine the derision if that had happened yesterday or last week or last month or last year? And we try to tell people a witness about Jesus. Can you imagine what kind of rebuff you would get? Imagine what people would say back to you. 
It was a pure miracle of the highest order. Miracles are not easily accepted by people who don't believe. So let me ask that question again. Why would anyone doubt the virgin birth? Because it's an unexplained miracle. You have to start with faith in all this. Without faith, none of this can come to pass. You see, you have to begin at the point of understanding that God in Romans 12, 3 said, I've given everyone a measure of faith. That means you have the ability to believe what is unbelievable in the norm, in the earth, in the soul realm. It's an unexplained miracle. We know the virgin birth happened because we know what the Word of God says and we believe the Bible. Now, no, no poor in scriptures that does it tell us why God particularly did it the way he did it. Liberal theologians believe that the early church simply made the story up. They believe that it is some kind of a, uh, a story that uh, would enhance who Jesus was and would enhance their story and move their, uh, their church along, move their story of the church along. But even if you deny the virgin birth, you still have to account for the life that Jesus lived and for all the things that he did. Where did he come from? We say he came from God. Whose son was he really? We say he was God's son. How did he accomplish all the miracles and, and other evidences that he was and is the son of God? So what are the reasons we should believe? Uh, we all kind of know the reasons we shouldn't believe. Because people just refuse to believe the, the credible word of God. Because they refuse to exercise their faith. It takes faith to do any of this. It takes faith for us to come together on this Sunday morning and believe that we're worshiping a God Amen. and honoring Jesus who was resurrected from a tomb after being born of a virgin and who was ascended back into heaven and pleads our case standing at the right hand or sitting at the right hand of the Father. It takes a lot of faith to believe that. Welcome to the club. You're here. Otherwise, you have no reason for being here at all if you don't believe this. The New Testament explicitly says Jesus was born of a virgin. Matthew 1, Luke 1, they say conception of Jesus Christ took place while Mary was a virgin through the power of the Holy Spirit. How many have ever read that? How many have ever heard that? How many have ever seen that? Not open to question for those of us who believe, is it? But it's a big question for those who don't believe. As one writer put it, it's impossible to make the terminology of the virgin birth, birth refer to something other than the virgin birth. I mean, th that's a pretty uh, black and white issue there. Either, there. either it was or it wasn't. There's no halfway. So what are, the, what are some of the reasons we should believe this? Why should we believe it? Well, the virgin birth agrees with the rest of the Bible. You know, you know in the Old Testament, prophecies were being given that there would be this Messiah, this Emmanuel, this Son of God, this this child of the king who would come and would be born of a virgin. Look at uh, Genesis 3.15. First, the first time we're, we're told about the seed of the woman coming. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Talking to the devil, talking to the serpent. And between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So the phrase has long been understood as early reference to the virgin birth of Christ. And Isaiah 7, 14 says it much more plainly. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Is it, could it be any more clear than that? Could it be any more uh, open than that? The angel who appears to Joseph in a dream quotes that very passage. And John 14, we read earlier, says, The word became flesh, the son of God. The virgin birth was a supernatural entrance into the world. And the third reason is the Bible focuses on the baby, not the way he was born. The Bible mentions it, it moves on from it, and starts talking about the baby. Look, there's a lot left unsaid that we'd like to know. I, I know. God didn't tell us everything, but he told us everything we need to know if we use our faith to believe what he told us. So uh, if we don't start from the, the point of faith, we can't get here at all. The Bible tells us enough to anchor our faith in what the Word of God says. But it doesn't tell us enough. I, I got a whole bunch more questions <laughs> that I'm going to ask when I get there. <laughs> I believe God's going to, to, to enlarge our capacity to know. I don't know if he'll use a, a DVD, Bluetooth, uh, Blu-ray, uh, and play, play about uh, two or three million years for us and let us see all the stuff that, we didn't, that he didn't put in here. But I've got enough here to know that by faith, I trust this. I trust the Word of God. I've seen it work in my life. Have you seen it work in your life? 
Have you seen times when you were sick and God healed you? Have you seen times when you accepted your, your salvation by faith? When you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart? See, the thing is, we, we, we kind of limit our faith, but we do believe in our salvation. See, the miraculous conception of Christ lets us know that it's not, he was not just some ordinary baby like everyone else. And I believe the reason that we refer back to this and, and that God gives us miracles today is to refer us back to the very fact that he did a miracle when Jesus came in the first place. He wants us to know that he cares enough about us to continue this miraculous way of God. That what he did then is not the only time he'll do it. He still cares about us. He cares about the small and the large. Look, we can't understand it all because it's a mystery. I mean, like mysteries. I mean, you're trying to figure it out before you get to the end. Well, don't watch Hallmark. They're all just the same, okay? Every... <laughs> Yeah, I have to watch a chick flick now and then on Hallmark with this woman right here. <laughs> and I keep, I tell her, I'll, we'll sit there and I'll say, I just don't know how this is going to end. I just don't know if this, I don't know if they'll ever get together or not. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, this may be impossible. <laughs> how do I get out of this now? I don't know. How do I get, how do I get to Hallmark? <laughs> not sure. My point is, the miracles of God, you cannot figure out from the beginning. It's not like a Hallmark movie. God is going to do something that you hadn't thought of. God's going to do something in, in His script that you don't have in yours. And when God does that, it will astound you. You'll go, I never thought it could happen that way. I never knew that God could do something that glorious, something that profound. It's presented, this, this fact is presented in the Bible as concrete truth. You can read it for yourself in Luke 1. He, he didn't pull any punches. He said the virgin birth happened, and he told when it happened, during the reign of Caesar, when, issued, when he issued a census. He's, I mean, he's laying it out. And you can go back and look at historical fact and know that that happened, that degree for a census for the entire Roman Empire. While Quirinius, he's naming names and he's giving dates. He's giving events. He's telling us what happened and when it happened. These are facts that can be checked by history, not Bible history, but by historical calendars to prove. Luke didn't say once upon a time in a land far away, a young virgin gave birth and they lived happily ever after. No, he didn't say that. That would be a fable, a bedtime story. What he's telling us is God took his hand and moved into human history and changed the routine of the supernatural. He said, the natural laws can't stand against what I'm about to do. And it will confound you, and you will have to take this by faith. People will not be readily and easily uh, ready to believe it. But I'm going to do it, and then you can, you can promote it, and you can tell it, and you can witness to it. He was born just like every other man, except for the fact that he was born of the Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary. Whatever it means to be truly human, he was that. The Bible presents him as being a fully human person. Yes, he was God. That really bogs our mind down, doesn't it? Born as a person, as one of us, yet divinely God. But we read earlier, he laid aside. His, he didn't think it was, was improper to lay aside his divine attributes to walk as men. Otherwise, we could never assume to do what he did. We can never assume to expect miracles and to see salvation happen and to see the blind made able to see again and the lame to walk again and families put back together and addictions be broken. We'd never be able to see those things in the miraculous because it, we would not have believed God in the way. We would have been like the Old Testament. We'd have still been under the law and not seen God move in the way he moved through the New Testament, especially after the Holy Spirit came upon people. Jesus was as much a man as any man who ever lived. Not an alien, not an angel, not some half-man, half-God creature that you read in Greek mythology. It wasn't a unicorn or, you know, any of those guys. He didn't come out of some fable somewhere, some mythology, no. The actual miracle took place nine months before the birth when the Holy Spirit moved over Mary and she became the mother of the Son of God. Nothing mysterious about the delivery. He was born like we were in pain and anguish and agony. He developed in his mother's womb just like all babies do. He grew, 
delivered in the same way babies were delivered in that day, nursed at his mother's breast just like babies are today. That's only one part of the story, isn't it? He was also fully divine and fully God. Miracles marked his entrance and his exit. Think about it. Miraculous beginning, miraculous ascension. Again and again, I see as I read Scripture, Jesus pulling back the supernatural veil, that gossamer curtain that's thinly veiled between the realm of heaven and the realm of earth. He stood on earth to pull those two together, to let us see inside the heavenlies, which man had never seen before, which man could not go into. But Jesus came to say that veil is rent. That, that gossamer curtain that thinly separates you from God is no longer in effect. Now you have access to God because I have come and I have given my life and I have been resurrected and I am going to stand and sit at the right hand of the Father pleading your case because you can ask anything in my name and I will hear you and God will do it. That's the authority we have because Jesus came. On the boundary between two worlds. I've stood, I, I remember as a kid, there's that one place up there in New Mexico and Colorado and what are the other states? Uh, uh, Arizona. And you can put your foot on and you can put your two hands and you're in all four states at one time. Now that, that seems weird, doesn't it? You think about that. This is exactly what Jesus did. He came to earth but still remained heavenly. I preached that a while back. I've been on this supernatural thing for a long time. Mothers, uh, uh, um, moms and, and, and children uh, who don't understand and fathers and daughters and sons who won't, who won't be able to grab hold of this. Uh, go back to the Word of God. You, you try to teach your children about the Word of God. You need to teach them first of all the supernatural side. Uh, you need to teach them that, that salvation comes supernaturally. Teach your children. Moms, teach your kids. Dads, teach your kids. Teach them the supernatural power of salvation. It didn't just come automatically. It's just not some rote message that we say, but we have to understand who Jesus is and what he did. Teach them about the cross. Teach them about the virgin birth. Teach them about the resurrection. Then they'll understand what salvation truly is. And when they say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, cleanse me from my sin, they'll have a reference point. So moms, dads, teach your kids how to move into the supernatural, how to understand the supernatural, that it's not just something we do out of some rote thing. We don't just come down and sign a card. We need to understand who Jesus is and what he did. So he pulls back this curtain and the dichotomy of who Jesus is and what he wants to do. He was hungry and thirsty and yet he fed 5,000. He slept in a boat yet he walked on the water. He wept at the tomb but he raised Lazarus from the dead. Died on Friday but he rose on Sunday. It all fits together perfectly actually. You see he was born of a woman yet also born of a virgin. He was just like us but really nothing like us at all until we come to know him. He was one of us, yet he came from God above. So these things that seem to separate him from us actually draw us together with him. He was the son of Mary, but he was the only begotten son of God. Grew up in Nazareth. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yet they rejected him because of their unbelief. He could do no mighty miracles. He's our friend. He's our savior. He's our redeemer. He's the sovereign Lord. Little children love him, yet he baffles the greatest minds in all of history. His movements and his miracles and his love and his ability to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, baffles the minds of those who would hate, who would despise. Read the Bible. See for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Go back and study the, the life of Jesus Christ. It's there again and again and again. Two sides of Jesus showing who he is, showing us who God is. He was like us in his birth, but he was not anything like us in his birth. The virgin birth. So I ask you, if God should decide to become a man, how do you think he'd do it? I submit this much is true. We would expect God to make an unusual entrance into the world, wouldn't we? Well, he did and he didn't. Think about it. A baby born in a stable? Is that God's way? Wouldn't you think he would? And this is the way the Jews thought. I think he's going to come on a white horse and he's coming with an army from heaven. And he's going to set us free. He's going to loose the bonds of the Romans. And he's going to put us on the top of the mountain. And we're going to rule and reign forever. That's what the prophet said. Many answers to this question. But coming here also meant that he must be born into the earth. You've heard me teach this before. Why did he need to come 
born of a woman and the seed of God. Because this earthly birth gave him the authority to regain what Adam lost in the garden. Satan was not born into this earth. He has no rightful authority here. Human form, Jesus came as human form. No authority over those who are born. He has no authority over those who are born again. None. Satan has no authority over you. This is why Jesus, when he transferred his authority to us, he gave us the power to do what we could never do on our own. And yet some of us are still trying to work out our problems on our own without trusting the authority and the power of Jesus. Because he's God, his entrance into the earthly form needed to be miraculous. It was the imagination of God that said, I'm going to have him born in a place where nobody will know him. Nobody will understand this. Nobody will recognize him. But this gave Jesus the authority to come and to take back what man had lost through sin. And because of the virgin birth, we are redeemed through the blood of a sinless human being who was divinely God who laid his divinity aside while he showed us how we could live. Here we have a miraculous conception, a normal earthly birth all in one. God did it. You have exactly what the Bible presents when you put them together. The impossible made possible. The glorious coming in swaddling clothes. The Son of God showing up in a way that no one expected. Before it happened, no one would have expected it. But after it happened, we say, sure, that makes perfect sense to me now that we read the Word of God. It's just like God to think of something like a virgin birth, isn't it? To astound the minds of men, to confuse those who would be unbelievers, and to keep them in a place where they have to use their faith to believe God. This is a miracle here. And there's enough to believe for those who want to believe it. And there's enough question and doubt for those who choose not to believe it. But that's where we use that Romans 12, 3 measure faith. You did it when you came to Christ. The Bible says you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. So when you confess that Jesus was your Lord and your Savior, you did it by faith because there was no physical evidence. You didn't turn green or purple. You, you didn't have a new body. You didn't change the way you look. He just came inside you and set you free and put your heart into his family. This is the way it happened. But it all happened by faith. See, all miracles are like that. All miracles come by faith. All miracles that God performs. They don't force us to believe. They simply invite us to make our own decision. They, they simply say, I believe God and I believe God is who he says he is because I read the word and it spoke to my heart and it changed my life and because of that I can believe. If you say miracles can't happen, then you probably find some way to explain away the virgin birth, to explain away the resurrection. Uh, uh, my friend, uh, my friend, what's his name? Evidence that demands a verdict. Josh McDowell. <laughs> Don't tell Josh I couldn't remember his name. Uh, Saw him many times, and we'd always talk about his book because it, it, it really transformed the way I thought about the resurrection. You know, he was an agnostic, and he was set out in college to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. And as he went deeper and deeper into it, he found out, hey, this thing is probably real. Wow, you know, I, and he became a believer. You see, when we try to disprove the things of God and we sincerely go into it to say, God, I have questions and I, he wasn't really looking for the answer, but the Holy Spirit began to work. Anytime we have questions, if we'll open ourselves up and not just, not just uh, create some tricky question that causes a Christian to go, duh, I don't know, you know, because how many feel like that sometimes? When somebody asks you a question you can't answer, and you go, uh, I have to go ask my pastor. I have, to go, I have to go find out somewhere. I don't have all the answers either. But let me tell you the greatest answer you can have. The greatest answer you can have is your own testimony. We overcome the world by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. How do you account for this man called Jesus? Who is he? To answer that question, you've answered the virgin birth question. If you get to know him in relationship, all your questions will be answered. You'll begin to understand what you didn't understand before because it'll come to you by the Holy Spirit's distribution. The Holy Spirit delegates and distributes those things that we can never do. God never says pick and choose what you believe. That's not the way the gospel is. The story of Jesus is a seamless garment. It's, it's a whole cloth. The truth is that way. When you get truth, it's the whole thing. You can't say, well, I believe that part of truth, but I don't believe the other part of truth. Well, then that's not truth to you. 
When you do that, you've ripped the whole garment to shreds because you're picking a thread out here, here and there. How many hate to get a, a you know, picked thread on your sweater? Doesn't this bug you? You know, you get the three or four of those things. Well, if you cut them off, you know, then that thread unravels and you've got a big old hole in it. That's the same way with the gospel. You, you, can't, you can't just pick and choose what you believe. You believe it all or you don't believe it at all. Truth is a whole claw. History teaches when men begin to doubt the virgin birth, they don't stop there. Listen, wonder is not a sin, but it leads to doubt. Doubt is not a sin unless you stay there because then it leads to unbelief. So wonder is the seed of doubt. Doubt is the seed of unbelief. So we need to stay away from both. We, we need, if we wonder, we need to go to God. If we have doubts about things, we need to go to God and back to the Word. We need to say, Holy Spirit, you've got to reveal to me. You've got to reveal to me. You've got to show me through revelation what this means because I have some questions. Questions are, are not a sin. But, not, but, but having a question and not trying to find the answer, that becomes sin. You see, that's where a lot of people live today. When, when we have questions and we don't we don't really want to find the answer. We don't try to find the answer. We end up in sin because we end up in doubt and unbelief because we don't ask God to help us understand it. So the Bible teaches that Jesus came through the womb of a virgin. It's okay at this season to have supreme confidence and to celebrate this season because Jesus Christ was the Son of God, born of Mary, a virgin. The supernatural birth is a sign from God that he has entered the human race. And I said to you a moment ago, and let me, let me clarify this. I believe that your greatest witness, especially we can use this time of the year as a special time to witness to others. Because here we are, believers. And here we are with the Word of God. And so when you start trying to explain something, you may not have all the theological answers, but you have your testimony. You have that touch of God that you felt. You have that time when you said, yes, Lord, and he changed your heart and changed your life. You have that, that experience where he's healed you and he saved you and he set you free from your addictions, where he's put your family back together, where there's been things that happened in your life that had to be miraculous because you had tried and tried and tried and could never do them yourself. But all of a sudden you went to God and God solved the problem and answered your question. This is why we can testify. This is why we can say, like the blind man, I don't know how he did it. I don't know all the answers, but I know this. Once I was blind, but now I can see. That's our answer. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, we win people to Christ. Glory to God. We're so far ahead of where the early church was, and yet they won 3,000 in a day because of the power of the Holy Spirit that was on them, and they carried it into the streets. Yet we cower in the corner, fearful that somebody might ask us a question that we can't answer. Don't worry about the questions. Say, listen, you can believe that if you want to, Here's what happened to me. Jesus, born of a virgin, crucified on a cross, resurrected again, changed my life. And that's the greatest testimony of all. Hallelujah. So I sum up with this. God stooped low to be born in a manger. <laughs> that baby was deity in diapers. Think about it. That's what he was. A king in a cradle, king of kings, lord of lords. No human process could have produced who Jesus was. Had to be the power of the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and hang a banner out on your house about what happened that starry night. Say Jesus is Lord, and then put under it, not made by man. Because man did not do that. God did that. Amen. On the divine side, he was God. On the human side, he was us. But together, he did the miraculous. Continues to do it today. The wisest scholars, the simplest believers, all bow before the manger of Bethlehem. All the kings who've ever reigned and all the paupers who ever lived will come together one day to bow. To bow before this baby born in a manger. Come to bow and say, He's Lord. He's Lord. Every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of God, the baby born in a manger who's not a baby anymore. I wrote a song about that once. He's not a baby anymore. He's not a baby anymore, folks. It's easy for us at Christmas to kind of celebrate this baby because everybody loves a baby. 
Everybody can pick up a baby and touch a baby and hold a baby. But he's not a baby anymore. He's the risen Lord. He's the King of Kings. He's miraculous. All powerful. All victory resides in Him. All needs are met in His name. Everything you've looked for in your life, everything you've needed in your life, all in the name of Jesus. All in that little baby born who grew up to be king. Father, I pray this morning in this place. I pray, Lord, that you would touch us. Show us the truth of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, whoever, that's us, should not perish. Thank you for sending Jesus to us, a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Most of all, thank you for the crucified Lord and the resurrected Lord. Thank you, Jesus, touching us and blessing us now.